It's probable that you're sort of getting to grips with the concept of macronutrients. Just remind yourselves here, we're talking about protein, we're talking about carbs, uh, carbohydrates, we're talking about fats, lipids. That's what we mean, we mean by macronutrients. And we want to look at some strategies that athletes or physically active people might use in relation to these things. So first of all, I want to introduce you to the idea of carbo or glycogen loading. Okay, the idea of carbo or glycogen loading. Now, this is a, a fairly well understood process. However, it's not always well applied. I want, to, I want to sort of show you why. I want to introduce you to the idea that carbo loading is a seven day process now this is the bit that people seem to be less clear about and needs to be the way that it's done properly okay so if we imagine that we're going to pass through seven days before some competition or some event what might we do in order to get our glycogen stores up and i'll look at the advantage and disadvantage in a second so day one of that process what we are going to do is we are going to deplete glycogen now obviously what that's going to mean is a fairly intense kind of training session where we get our glycogen levels down as low as possible remember glycogen is stored in both the liver and the muscle but the predominant storage in the liver so we're trying to deplete and reduce uh, that storage what we're then going to do is over days over days two to three so you know effectively imagine this is a, a monday this would be the tuesday and the wednesday what we're going to do here is we are going to up arrow we are going to increase fat and protein intake now that doesn't mean we're going to eat silly foods as an athlete obviously they're going to be fairly sensibly and well sensibly chosen and well designed but we're going to minimize our sort of carbohydrate um, proportion in our diet for that period of time then what we're going to do is on day four i wonder if you are going to guess what this is on day four you're expecting me to see eat glycogen aren't you no uh, uh, carbohydrate sorry we are once again going to deplete deplete glycogen again so we're going to do another training session which almost eradicates that last little semblance of glycogen from a system of course there will still be some as you can imagine but then what we're going to do is on day five to seven you know this is the the last three days before uh, competition we are going to do effectively what we would call carb rich eating now that is the process of glycogen loading carbo loading can notice that that is seven days and it's really important to get that point point across the other thing that i just want to mention to you is that there is clear evidence here of tapering okay remember that tapering is reducing the training load okay we, we are obviously this is going to this here is a training bout, but after that it's really about sort of tapering down and coming back into just thinking about diet and rest effectively before uh, performance now there's good and bad about this so let's do the positives first there's loads of positives to this method and you've probably you may well have experimented with this so these are some of the things we can get up to studies show up to 50 percent greater glycogen stores because effectively we get an overcompensation sometimes called a super compensation what this is going to mean is that it's longer takes longer to reach exhaustion okay so someone is going to be able to perform at moderate intensities for longer before they reach exhaustion before they deplete glycogen by definition so what that's going to mean is it means for us increased endurance performance okay so that obviously for our marathon runner our distance runner our open water swimmer etc that's a really really good thing it's also good for us if we go to the gym and do a really big cardio day i suppose but there are negatives and we must address those negatives because of course everything has its other side right so we're going to look at those negatives too we might experience hypo let me i always sp struggle with this spelling glycemia in depletion phase so in the periods where we actually go through the depletion we might experience low blood sh sugar and poor regulation of blood sugar as a result of that we might also experience lethargy sometimes that's described as heaviness we might also experience irritability <laughs> why is it so hard to spell this irritability too many eyes in that word aren't there irritability we might also experience water retention kind of bloating is associated with this practice as well which of course could be detrimental and we might also have gi problems gastrointestinal problems you know tummy ache for want of a better phrase okay so obviously there's some positives there there's some negatives there now beyond that 
I want to look at some other factors that relate to timing. So I just generally speak, uh, speaking want to call this timing of meals in relation to, of course, some kind of exercise about a competition, a match, a contest, a training. What should we be thinking about? Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to take you to pre-workout, pre-performance, and I want to take you to three hours before. So let's say you're a football player, hockey player, tennis player, three hours before kickoff, pushback, whatever it happens to be. What are you going to do? Is you're going to take on a meal that is what we call low GI. GI does not have mean, um, I should, th this is glycemic index. We're going to have some brown rice. We're going to have a piece of chicken. We're going to have some egg. We're going to have something which is effectively a slow release food. Okay, so three hours before a meal, in, for want of a better terms. And this is going to increase not surprisingly, we've said this before, glycogen stores, fantastic. But that's not the only pre that we can consider. We can also consider pre-performance two hours. So this is an hour later, right? Two hours before, let's say, our competition, our race, our match, whatever it happens to be. We might be taking on something like an energy bar. A piece of fruit could even be here something which effectively high GI, so it's fast acting food, and it's gonna it's gonna be in the form of simple carbs or simple sugars. We wouldn't be taking on starches here. And what does what does this act as? It acts as a top up to glycogen, a top up potentially. And it prevents okay, oh I think my pen's acting up on me. Just bear with me a second. It prevents hypoglycemia again hypoglycemia my word that's tight in that corner so there's some factors to consider now other points i want to make to you is of course we're going to do certain things during our performance especially if it's a long duration performance what are we going to do well the guidelines is we need 60 to 90 grams per kilogram of body mass of carbs okay so uh if you are 100 kilos which would be you know reasonably heavy we would need between 60 and 90 grams per kilogram per hour okay that is the guidance and we also want to make sure that we take on fluids and hydrate if you're interested in more than fluid stuff obviously we've got tutorials on that specifically now finishing this off what do we want to do post exercise so a couple of things i'm going to look at um i'm going to look at uh, protein in a second but post we are looking for 30 mins after competition, after performance, what do we want? We want one to 1.5 grams of carbs per kilo, per kilogram. So again, we've got quite a specific measure there. And what do we wanna do is we wanna repeat every two hours. So it's not just about taking some carbs on straight after in that sort of carbohydrate window, but we want to be doing that repeatedly, and that's the approximate, well, specific measure. Now, before I finish this tutorial off, I also want to look at protein supplementation. I'm really confident that some of you will be using this protocol, so I just want to give you some specifics on this to make sure that if you're using it, you're using it kind of correctly. So a couple of things. We do this, we, we do protein supplementation, typically after exercise. Why? Because it increases protein protein synthesis. In other words, it helps the adaptation process to actually occur efficiently. So this is really good because this impacts both aerobic and anaerobic systems. Okay, so this is going to be positive. So one of the things we want to say here is this is, if I just take this over here, this protein supplement is not just for strength, you could well be an endurance athlete and this is relevant to you. This is about fueling the adaptation process. Now, with that in mind, what is the actual protocol we wanna describe here? We're gonna argue that there is a one hour protein window, okay? In other words, the protein that a person takes post-training, post-exercise, post-performance should be done within one hour. And this finding, folks, is well studied and it's robust. And the other factor that's studied is that it seems an optimal intake is in the region of 30 grams per intake. Any more than that, and it's it, the actual uh, ingestion absorption rates decrease quite rapidly. So that appears to be the approximate protocol for protein supplementation. Now, exactly what protein you take will vary. Thanks for listening.